Greetings, students. So today we're going to start looking at the cell cycle. So this may seem a little bit random after cell signaling, and you know, it kind of is. Cell signaling and cell cycle are kind of two cellular processes that for some reason AP just said, let's lump those together into one unit. So why not? Here we go. Um, so let's uh, begin with our tip for success. I really like this one. Um, ponder. Okay. And then let's kind of get, get to business. So um, we've been looking at the eukaryotic cell here for the last several um, units. So we began by looking at cells in general, and then we began to zoom in on different organelles. So we zoomed in on the cell membrane, and we focused on how materials are transported across through diffusion, osmosis, active transport, exonentocytosis, etc. Um, then we zoomed in on the mitochondria and chloroplasts and look at how cells produce energy. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on the nucleus and begin to get to know the processes that happen in there a little bit better. So I'd like you to take a moment and remind me of the structure of the nucleus. There were these substructures, the nuclear membrane and the nuclear pores. What are those? And then what's inside of the nucleus again? And why doesn't it exit through those pores? Take a moment. And here's the answers. So the structure of the nuclear membrane, um, you may recall, ah, has these, uh, first of all, it has a double membrane, and the double membrane is called a nuclear envelope. So double membrane means there's there's two phospholipid bilayers, um, kind of an inner and an outer, and we call that the nuclear envelope. And then there's these little holes in there called nuclear pores. And so those pores let most things in and out. There's one thing though that's so huge that it can't go in and out. And that's the main thing whose job the nucleus is to store. And that is DNA. So the DNA is inside the nucleus and it's a huge molecule. So it's not able to pass through those pores even while almost everything else in the cell can. So we are beginning to look more closely at DNA with this first unit. So um, to begin, what is cell division? So cell division is this process where a cell reproduces, producing two identical daughter cells. So if you had bio before, these photos probably look familiar to you. Um, you definitely learned this quite thoroughly in, in bio in the past, if you had it. Um, but if you haven't had bio, this might be a better image. Think of it like a photocopier. You know, we're photocopying the cell. We're making an identical copy of the cell. Now, a logical question would be, why would we want to do that? Well, there's a number of places where we need to do that. One is growth. You go from this little tiny baby to a bigger kid and ultimately an adult. And so you need more cells to do that. And um, the way you get more cells is through cell division. You make identical copies of the cells and that allows you to grow. Um, wound repair, if you get a cut, somehow your skin magically heals over. How does it do it? Well, cell division, it makes new cells to cover over the injured area. Um, if you're a single-celled organism, then this may be how you reproduce. And so some um, eukaryotic cells will simply reproduce by cell division. One cell just kind of splits into two, um, and that's how they make offspring. So um, what I want to look at first is cell division in prokaryotic cells and then cell division in eukaryotic cells. So in prokaryotic cells, they use a process called binary fission. So binary fission is a method of cell division used by bacteria and two different organelles in eukaryotic cells. And hopefully you are able to identify those two organelles as the mitochondria and chloroplast. Remember we said the endosymbiotic theory um, suggests that um, those organelles descended from bacteria that got engulfed into a larger cell. And lo and behold, during cell division, the mitochondria and chloroplasts actually divide on their own, kind of independently of the other parts of the cell. And they do so using this process of binary fission, which modern bacteria still use. So um, how does it work? Well, it's pretty straightforward. What happens is um, in a bacterial cell, remember they have a single circular chromosome. So that single circular chromosome replicates and so where you had one single circular chromosome, now you have two. We're going to talk about how that is done in a later unit in much more detail. Um, and then the cell grows and gets larger. And then the cell slowly kind of starts to pinch in half and poof, you eventually have 
two cells, each of which has its own copy of DNA. Um, bacteria are extraordinarily efficient at this and in a matter of hours can have you know, dozens of generations cranked out like crazy, which is insane. Eukaryotes though, are a lot more complicated in how this takes place. And so I wanna break it down by player's process. So the first player is the DNA itself. Now, we haven't really talked a whole lot about DNA other than to acknowledge its existence. Um, we're gonna to continue to talk about DNA for a long time in here. <laughs> so what do you need to know at this point? So stretched end to end, the DNA in one of your cells would be about two meters long. That should absolutely blow your mind and raise the question, well, how the heck do we get it to fit inside that cell? Um, it creates this problem, like how do we get this to fit and then how do we prevent it from getting all tangled up like this poor chap right here you can imagine if you had this really really super long rope it, it twists and turns and tangles and it just gets kind of messy to deal with so how do cells deal with that well the answer is that they package that dna and there's a couple levels at which it packages it so here's your regular old dna molecule and the most basic level is it sort of wraps the dna around these special proteins called histones and so you can see them wrapped around like beads on a string. And then eventually those beads start to come together and interact to form this slightly um, tighter coil. And we call that tighter coil chromatin. Chromatin is a relatively loose network of DNA and protein. So it's kind of like, it would kind of look like if you took a rope and just kind of threw it in a heap. It's still kind of this mess, but, um, you know, but it is actually a little bit organized. What we can then do is we can take that chromatin and coil it up even more through this very highly specified process. And what happens is we coil up even more, we get this really tight packed structure, which we then call a chromosome. And again, a chromosome is that DNA wrapped around proteins. So DNA, chromatin, and chromosomes are essentially the same thing. It's just that that DNA wraps around the proteins, and when it's a little bit coiled, we call it chromatin. When it's a lot coiled, we call it a chromosome. And here's just another picture that just kind of shows that same thing. But what I do like about this picture is it kind of highlights, oh dear, my battery's running low. Um, it kind of highlights that the genes, which you may have heard of, are little segments of DNA. And again, we'll talk more about that later. The other thing about DNA that you need to know are these terms diploid and haploid. So here's a picture of a cell that is haploid, and you can see it has one, two, three little chromosomes here. And here's a picture of a cell that is diploid. And based on this, you may be able to infer the definitions of these two. So a diploid cell are, is a cell that has two non-identical copies of each chromosome. We call those non-identical copies homologous chromosomes. And that's a term that's gonna become very important in our next unit. Um, and so you can see there's like two, two reds, two blues, two yellows. And again, these are not identical. So these two blues, one came from mom, one came from dad. So um, this one might code for brown eyes, this one might code for blue eyes. They're not identical, but they have the same type of information. We represent a diploid cell with this 2N symbol to indicate that there's two copies of each chromosome. And in this case, N would equal three because there's three types of chromosomes. A haploid cell is one in which there's only one copy of each chromosome. So there's just one red, one blue, and one yellow. Last thing I want to tell you about DNA is the human genome. So what are our numbers? You know, well, um, most of the cells in your body are what we call somatic cells. And most of the cells in your body are diploid. What that means is they contain 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. So basically there'd be 23 pairs like this for a total of 46 in a human cell. And again, all of your body cells except the gametes are somatic cells. That raises the interesting question, well, what's a gamete then? Well, a gamete um, are the egg and sperm cells. So Females produce eggs, males produce sperm. Those are the only cells in the body that are gametes. And these gametes are haploid, which means they contain 23 total chromosomes, only one copy of each chromosome. So a sperm or egg cell would have 23 individual chromosomes like that. 
every other cell in your body would have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. The next player is something called a spindle. Um, the spindle is a network of microtubules, and maybe you remember that term from unit two where we looked at cells. Uh, microtubules are these protein fibers, and you can see them right here, all these little thread-like lines. That is the spindle. Um, and these help move chromosomes around the cell in ways that we'll discuss in a moment. Um, the centrosomes anchor the microtubules at the end of the cell. So here you can see a centrosome. Here you can see the other centrosome, and the spindle fibers radiate out from that centrosome. Um, animal cells also contain a structure called centrioles, which are these kind of cylindrical little things, like these little Coke cans at the end of the cell. Plant cells don't have those centrioles. Okay, so now that we have this, um, these players down, now we can get into the process. How is it that a cell actually divides. And for that, I think we're going to wait for the next screencast.